Hello, and welcome everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, let's just uh, give a moment for everyone to, to get into the room. So I want to thank you all for joining me this week. And as always, I would uh, just want to start with a couple thank yous for the, the donations offered. Um, this satsang is supported by donation, and those are greatly appreciated. And so I wanted to thank uh, Kiara and uh, Samina, Thane, and Patricia. Thank you all so much. I also wanted to give another uh, big shout out to, um, to Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne has been greatly uh, helpful with the technology and, and she's also been helpful with the second project that I'm doing uh, with Rick Archer and uh, Jack O'Keefe when we're creating this uh, nonprofit called the Association of Professional Spiritual Teachers. And the website should be live, uh, you know, maybe later this evening or uh, later in the week, we're still just uh, doing a soft launch. But I deeply want to thank Suzanne for all of her help that she's bringing forward, and she's been working overtime. And what we're doing together is we're creating a um, an educational uh, group where teachers can come together and learn how to show up and be uh, respond to their students and their community with a greater sense of professionalism and ethics. And so. We're really excited about this. So I want to thank Suzanne deeply. Also, I want to, uh, a big shout out to Danny up in Alaska. Uh, he went on a little mini retreat in this cabin and uh, he took a picture of my book, Fully Human, Fully Divine with these, these beautiful Alaskan uh, snow-capped mountains and it really made me light up. And so uh, for all of you who are, who are showing up and whatever capacity, whether it's through sharing the work or sharing the Dharma or simply through just giving yourself fully to your spiritual path. You know, this is what this is. This work is all about. It's about us jumping in life together, you know, and fully coming into alignment with our truth, and this greater truth and wisdom, which is in all of our hearts all of our hearts. And so, yes, I'd like to welcome uh, Carlos and Jake and Thane. Uh, welcome everyone this evening. And so, uh, you know, today is, is uh, you know, on the lunar calendar, we're having the new moon. The new moon is a wonderful time to launch something new. It's also a wonderful time to let go of that which is old. And so I thought a fun title for tonight would be Out with the Old and In with the New. Out with the Old and In with the New. And so in order to let go of the old, we have to give ourselves some space. Some space, because one of the things that happens within us all is, is these old habits they're just that. They become habits. They become ways of being. They develop these tendencies, these repetitive patterns in our psyche, in our body, in our, in our mental state, in our emotional state. And in order to let go of something, well, first we have to step back and look at it and see. See that it's there. We have to be able to identify it, see it clearly from the space of awareness. If we're not aware of what's happening within us, well, you know, we'll just be eternally lost. Eternally lost is stuck in our habits. Stuck in our habits. And so yesterday I, I found myself at a, uh, a wedding of a good friend of mine. And it was in uh, the beautiful mountains of Silverton, Colorado. It was in this uh, little little old lodge. It was probably once a mining lodge, you know, probably, um, you know, from the 1800s. It was sitting on this cliff overlooking uh, this little river. It was so beautiful to be out there. You could feel the hugeness of the sky and the supreme sense of silence. Such silence. And it was funny to watch as um, 
and I was watching this this play before me of one of my good friends getting married. And I would, would go back and forth between, you know, focusing on the wedding and what the, uh, what the minister was saying. And then my eyes just kept going up to these big mountains and then the, the vast blue sky. You know, when we're on this path, it's always, it's always helpful to hold these two views. You know, the fast, spacious container that holds us all. The space of freedom, the space of peace, the space of love. If we want to live a life in a sane way, with any, any sense of clarity or mindfulness or freedom, we have to always be identified with that hugeness. But see, most of us, we're identified with simply the play. And for me, you know, yesterday when I was at the wedding, I was watching this play. It was a beautiful play, you know, two friends who'd fallen in love and they have a baby on the way and they're so excited, you know, just bought a house. And uh, this particular friend of mine, he actually just got back from running a, um, um, one of these ultra marathon races in, uh, it was in Switzerland and France, and I think Italy too, through the Alps, the Mount, uh, uh, I don't know if I'll say it correctly, Mount Blanc, I think, race. Uh, and uh, it was 106 miles, an extraordinary feat for any human being. And of course, when, when you're in a race like that, you know, all your focus is going to be just simply on making your next step. And sometimes life is like that. We're just focusing on making that next step, whether it's up or down or this way or that way. But, you know, when he got done with the, the race, you know, he ended up going into the emergency room twice. You know, I think once in Switzerland and then once one when he got back here uh, to Colorado. And I thought, you know, I was, I was speaking to him and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I want to really congratulate you on that on that big race <laughs> but i want to remind you of the big picture the big picture you know he bit off more than he could chew he did a 106 mile a marathon uh, he bought a house and got married all in the same week and you know sometimes when we're here on planet earth we just get lost in so much doing so much so much busyness and i looked at him he looked so tired i said give yourself some rest <laughs> you know it's good just to you know just take the edge off a little bit and relax a little bit and he smiled and he said yeah craig that's one of the things that i do is sometimes i bite off more than i can chew and i've done this too so many times in life just bitten off more than i can chew it's one of the things that our ego does it's eternally wanting to keep ourselves busy wanting to climb this mountain or that mountain or, you know, be in the rat race or, you know, whatever that old phrase is, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, the people next door. You know, if they get a new flat screen TV, then you have to get a bigger one. It's, it can all be quite silly, quite silly. But if we're willing to just step back and see our life as a play, not take it so seriously, but instead to allow our focus to be vast, to be wide, to be spacious, to be free. Allow our focus, in a sense, to be everywhere and nowhere simultaneously. And then something begins to shift inside. You begin to wake up to this hugeness that's always here. And then when things don't work out, when you fall on your face, when you <laughs> lose a house or a marriage or a job or whatever it is, it doesn't absolutely destroy you. Because what you know yourself to be is something much, much greater. Much greater. You know, a good friend of mine, she, um, 
but she got cancer not once, but twice. And when we get, you know, uh, you know, a disease like cancer, it's easy to get lost in that. It's easy, you know, to <laughs> feel as if, oh no, our, our life is about to end. But when we step into this hugeness, or if we step into the silent presence of innocence, and we see there is something pure here, despite the cancer, you know, despite the heartache, despite the whatever it is in our life that's falling apart, that there's something quiet, there's something pure, there's something innocent here, something absolutely divine. It shifts everything. It shifts everything. We start to look at our, our illness, our sickness, or our <laughs> whatever tragedy it is that's happening in our life, because we all know this. You know, we all know our life will be absolutely tragic. <laughs> we might have lots of good days, but there's these times when just great tragedy comes. But when you're connected to this quiet presence of innocence, this quiet radiance, whatever comes your way, you see it from this space of inner resiliency. And it's a radically different way to live. Radically different when you can look cancer in the eye and smile. <laughs> Say, what is this? You may be something but I am something greater. I am something greater. So the willingness to look out at your life and to say, whatever, when, whatever tragedy comes your way, you can look at it and say, you may be something, but what I am is something greater. You are simply that thing that's simply arising within this space of my own presence. And it's a very, very powerful thing to be able to step back into the hugeness of your divinity and to let go. Let go of that which no longer serves you. Let go of that which is, well, no good. <laughs> Because all of us, we have these little things within us. Sometimes they're big things. We have these big places within us where we see, oh, this thing is no good. Can I let go of this? And see that there's something greater here. Something much, much greater. You know, I had this funny experience. I can't remember if I told this story or not, but about a month ago, uh, you know, I started uh, noticing that whenever I ate bread, my belly would expand and it would it would hurt so bad. It would ache. My skin would stretch. And I kept getting stuck on the couch again and again. And I had to do this silly thing that I never, ever wanted to do, which is become gluten-free and become one of those difficult people who, <laughs> who can't eat, <laughs> who can't eat, you know, this thing or that thing. And what I noticed was, is, you know, I, I had to let go of the gluten. But there was a part of my body that was absolutely addicted to it. My skin was wanting to, was, was literally crawling. It was literally crawling. You know, I felt like someone who, you know, was trying to quit smoking cigarettes or something. I never really experienced much addiction in my life and my my mind felt like it was on fire and my blood felt like it was boiling. It was so, so bizarre, you know, for me to have <laughs> this experience. But there was something greater there that knew I could no longer eat this. I could no longer have this as a part of my diet. And so I kept walking forward and it was quite difficult for two or three weeks there was times my wife would look at me. She's like, geez, there's something really wrong with you. <laughs> and I knew it was just my body. It was just that craving, just that addiction. 
And see, this is one of the definitions of suffering that the Buddha gave is, was when we crave, when we deeply desire. And it's not that all desire is bad. It's simply when we desire things or crave things that aren't good for us, that aren't helpful. And so it's that willingness to let go, even if it's hard, even if it's difficult. It's a tremendous act of self-love for you to continue walking forward. Saying no to that which does not serve you and yes to that which does. Yes to that which does. And sometimes letting go means letting go of our agenda. Yeah, I know there's, there's uh, you know, a couple people you know, who've showed up this evening. who found themselves overwhelmed with energy, overwhelmed with kundalini, overwhelmed with <laughs> too much you know, divine grace in their life, and it left them a little bit debilitated. And so it was difficult, quite difficult to let go of their agenda, to spend a little bit of time, maybe, <laughs> maybe a lot of time, in a bed, just breathing, just meditating doing yoga, letting go, working on healing. So sometimes letting go actually means we let go of our agenda and we step forward into God's agenda for us. And oftentimes, you know, we go through this process of, you know, what's called a healing crisis when we have to spend six months or a year or two years or three years or five years Just letting go and let God have our body. Let God heal us. Let God bring us into the truth. And so when I say out with the old, sometimes the old is that old ego that has its plan to do this thing or that thing or to think life should be this way or that way. I can say for about you know, a good 20 years I struggled with you know, barely having enough money to survive. And I used to fight with God and yell at God, say, where the hell is the, the money at? I could barely feed myself and these children. What's the, This is not fair. This is not right. And I had to let go of that complaining, that arguing, and be willing to step into the truth. And the funny thing is, is oftentimes when we step into the truth, it doesn't always mean our outward life gets better. But our inward life can improve 100%, 1,000%. You know, it's such a gift when you give up the gift of arguing with reality. Such a gift you give yourself. Tremendous gift you give yourself. When you step into the truth. And sometimes the truth is difficult. Sometimes there's something we have to do that we don't want to do. But it's the right thing, the true thing. And so if we want to be awake in the world, we must discover our true nature. And then begin living in alignment with the truth. A lot of people think spiritual awakening is about some moment that happens. But spiritual awakening is about every moment that happens. How do you respond? Do you respond with love? With clarity? With peace? Are you kind to yourself? Or judgmental? Are you kind to others? Or judgmental? You know, one of the greatest, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my teachers uh, used to say this, that one of the greatest poisons for our body, especially the heart and the mind and the throat, was judgment. You know, more and more we judge. It's like drinking poison. 
Same with anger. If, it, if it's anger that we're, we're not letting go of it, we're holding on to it intensely, you know, it can become cancerous inside because it's festering energy. And so this willingness to let go and to say, you know, I've had enough of my own judgments. <laughs> I've had enough of my own judgments. And that willingness to give yourself permission to stop judging. You know, it's funny because whenever we judge, it's like putting up a wall between us and the direct experience of oneness. It's very hard to live in oneness and judge. <laughs> you know, imagine, you know, stepping into oneness and then judging your neighbor or looking in the mirror and judging yourself, saying, I'm not beautiful. I'm too big. I'm too small. <laughs> I don't have enough hair. I have too much hair. Whatever it is that people say. And so it's a great gift you give yourself is to stop judging. It lets this wall fall down that we have between us and life. Between us and life. And so... I encourage you, because as we're transitioning into fall, fall is a wonderful time to let go. But for those of you who are down you know, south of the equator and who are transitioning into spring, spring is also a wonderful time to let go. And I think that every moment, every moment is a wonderful time to let go. To let go. To say, I'm tired of holding on. You know, I've had a couple, um, a few different students and friends come to me this week and they said, Craig, I've been struggling, feeling miserable. And of course, it breaks my heart whenever I see someone close to me feeling miserable. But one of my friends, he even said, you know, I want to be greatly honest here. And he was being honest about what was arising within his ego. He, he, he admitted clearly, I have this misery that's floating around in my consciousness. And it's good to see that, to be able to see that, oh, there's something floating around my consciousness, which is not me. It's not fully me. And so then the question is, was, well, how do we work with it? And I say, well, when we have something as heavy as misery, and I, you know, I, <laughs> misery used to be one of my best friends, you know, I used to hang out in my consciousness all the time. And, and I, I said this to my good friend here, I said, you know, one of the quickest ways to let go of misery is to do a yoga practice every day for 30 days. One of the things that yoga does is it flushes misery out of our body and it, it wakens up, awakens our cells. It awakens the 10,000 nadis throughout our subtle energetic body. And the thing with, with misery is misery, it, you know, it, it's, it's an emotion that starts off as sadness or heartache, but then it just becomes this habit. It becomes a way of being in the world and it starts to plant root starts to play at root throughout all, all the chakra centers. It tends to play at root in the 10,000 nadis. For those of you who don't know what nadis are, they're like, <laughs> they're like small chakras throughout the being, throughout the subtle energetic being. And so if you come to my yard, you'll see, um, I don't have one of those beautiful green grassy yards. You know, most of the summer we didn't have any rain. And so the only thing that, that lived this summer were, were weeds. You know, finally now in the fall, it's starting to rain again. So I'm getting my grass back, but, uh, and, and not so many weeds. But, you know, misery is a similar way. It's like, you know, your yard, you know, if you let it go and it just turns into weeds pretty soon, <laughs> you know, you're going to have thistle and all kinds of dandelions and 
you know, bindweed or whatever for a yard. And so what yoga does is it tills us from the inside. It's like retilling the soil and planting the new seeds, new seeds of radiance, of light, of love, of happiness, of joy. Now it's very difficult to do a 90 minute yoga practice and afterwards look in the mirror and say, I feel like a bag of rocks. You know, most of us, when we do yoga, even if it's just for like 20 minutes, it immediately lifts our mood because what yoga forces us to do, and I'm, I'm speaking about an asana practice, is it forces us to move all these aspects of our body where cobwebs have begun to form, where heaviness has sat in, where karma has, has taken root and simply become a habit. And so if you find yourself struggling with misery, do I encourage you? Get on your yoga mat. Practice for 30 days. And then after 30 days, you won't want to stop practicing. You want to continue opening and expanding and stretching. And stepping into new realms of being, new realms of existence. And see, letting go, again, sometimes letting go truly means stepping forward. When we're stuck in misery, our mind will say, I don't want to do anything. I can't do anything. I can't change. I feel like garbage. I feel like a bag of rocks. And so letting go means I'm willing to let go of that belief. The belief that my emotion that I'm currently experiences, experiencing defines who I am. This is one of the fundamental building blocks of ego one of the fundamental building blocks of the dream state is I am what I think and I am what I feel. And if we are willing to let go of, to let go of how we feel and to step into something greater, to say, no, I'm beyond my current emotional state. There is something here which is innocent, which is pure, which is alive, which is awake, which is radiant. There's something here that can look cancer in the eyes and say there's something here that's greater. The willingness to look misery in the eye and say there's something here that's greater. If we want to be awake in the world, you need to know who you are and you need to stand in that truth and say, no, I'm not going to allow an emotion like misery or despair. You know, that's one that I used to go to my teacher with again and again. I'd go to him with, with great despair. And he'd say, Craig, how are you doing? And I'd say, I feel like a bag of rocks. <laughs> he'd say, no, you are a child of God, a divine warrior. This is what you are. When he would say that, something would wake up inside and I'd say, oh, yes. <laughs> That's what I am. I had temporarily forgotten. I had forgotten. I was believing that my emotional state was what I was. And so in order to take charge of your spiritual life, to take charge of your path, you have to realize that there is something here which notices your emotional state something here and then you begin to turn around to look at that something and say well what is this something what is this what is this something that's here what is it what is this quiet innocence which hears the sound of my voice right now what is this what is it that I truly am? And so beautiful, beautiful. So I have a couple questions here. And then, of course, if anyone has uh, a question, uh, please, uh, please bring it forward. You know, and I just want to say uh, this big shout out to everyone who, who joined a little bit late. So I'll say hi to Brooke and, and Butch and 
hi Nicole and Michelle and Danielle and Neil and Tony, George and uh, Ivy and Adrian. And so, yes, it's uh, so good to see you all in, in this way. It always makes me smile uh, to see my friends join me on, on Sunday evening. So, so thank you all. Okay, so uh, here's a question that I have. Craig, I feel particularly exhausted as of late. Maybe the awakening is taking a lot out of me. I guess this will pass, right? I've been working more than usual than I usually do, and it's hard to adapt. Yes, and so, you know, this is one of the things that, you know, say 100 years ago, spiritual awakening tend, tended to happen when you were in a convent or a monastery or an ashram, and your whole life just focused on spiritual awakening or prayer or meditation. But see what's happening in this day and age is God is inviting this mass awakening. God is inviting the entire planet to wake up. And so she's giving birth. She's planting the seeds of awakening in all kinds of ordinary individuals like you and I. And it's very difficult to balance, extremely difficult. You know, I can tell you there was many times when I would just look at my work day and I was overwhelmed with energy. And I just said, gosh, I just don't think I can go to work. I think I just need to lay on this couch. And, you know, the funny thing was, was that oftentimes when I was so exhausted that I couldn't show up to work, God would cancel the work. So I would say, I was beginning ready to send an email to tell the person, hey, I'm not going to be able to show up for the session or, you know, I can't come into work today or whatever it was. But as soon as I turned my computer on, I would find that they had emailed me first saying, Craig, don't bother coming in. I'm feeling sick. And so I would smile that so many times God let me off the hook. God let me off the hook. But when God does not let you off the hook, and you're feeling overwhelmed with energy, I invite you to call upon his strength. Call upon her grace and invite her to carry you. There's this beautiful transformation that begins to happen inside when you look up at God and say, Lord, I cannot do this. And it's okay if you say this prayer every day. <laughs> Lord, I cannot do this. I don't have the strength, the energy, the power, the wisdom. Can you do this day for me? Can you work through me? Can you speak through me? Can you live through me? Can you love through me? Can you show up and, and, and teach through me, Lord? And so the more you let go into this, you begin to step into letting go of your will and inviting thy will to be done. Thy will to be done. Someone asked me this question this week. Craig, what's the difference between your will and thy will? Like, how do I tell the difference when it's my will or God's will? The more you invite God into you, and you listen for that quiet voice in the center of your heart to lead you, that's thy will. And so as you do this more and more, and as you give your day over, as you give your life over, as you give your relationships over, what you begin to discover is you start to feel thy will as this movement of grace in you. You feel like you're carried through life. Even if sometimes it's still a little bit physically difficult. And so I encourage you, my friend, to step into thy will. And the thing is, is what God is wanting for all of us is God wants us to be big. Not small. Not small. God wants us to be big. To be big. And so my, my good friend, uh, Adrian, who's here this evening, you know, he's done very difficult work building, you know, huge buildings above ground in New York City and then helped build the subways underground. And he was going through this intense kundalini awakening. In a lot of days, you know, he put his hand in his head and say, God, I cannot do this. Give me the strength. 
Give me the strength to walk forward. Give me the strength to live your truth, to step into something great. Give me the strength, Lord. Give me the strength. And eventually he wrote this beautiful story, this beautiful book, you know, about his journey. And of course, his journey, like our journeys, it's continuing to unfold. But when things get tough, ask for God's help. <laughs> when things are easy, ask for God's help. The more you let go into this, you begin to, to discover you are not the doer. God is the doer. And it's a great relief for her to live your life through you. Things always work out much better, much more simple, much more wise, much more free and blissful when you allow her will to move through you. So yes, a beautiful question, Neil. And so one of the things that that I was, was bringing forward here is that God is inviting us to be strong. And so she will push you beyond your normal human limits. You know, so many of us think that on the spiritual path, we're going to get a free ride where we just sit in bliss and we don't have to show up. You know, we, we do get that free ride when we die. It's called heaven, <laughs> if you're wondering. <laughs> but here on planet Earth, you're expected to show up and work. If we want the world to change, we have to get our hands dirty. We have to give everything. We have to be of service and know that the ultimate God, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate boss is God. The ultimate intelligence is God. And so, yes, there's so many times in life when I thought, I can't do this, but I would reach deep within and the strength would come forward. And so, yes, beautiful question. Beautiful question. Uh, this question is from Shannon. She's asking about working with the teacher. It says, Craig, I'm wondering what is a good indicator that I that um, that I should reach out for more support. Uh, at this moment, I'm having lots of emotions and energies arising, feeling somewhat scattered and frantic. I'm having a hard time sitting with them. Also, some deeper grief, fear, and shame is coming forth. Do you have any uh, tips on grounding? having a hard time being present with my kids and husbands and husband and uh, which is causing this guilt that I'm a bad mother. Yeah. And so, so Shannon, it's, it's not true. You're a great mother. You have a big loving heart, big loving heart. And so, so many of us, we go through these struggles and it's the same as what I was, was speaking about before. Always call upon God. Call upon your angels. Call upon your heart to come forward and to live through you. To live through you. My teacher used to say this to me. said, Craig, no one will do your path for you. You must live your path. No one's going to do your work. No one's going to solve your problems. You must walk forward in the truth with an open and sincere heart. You must give everything. And this is what the path demands. But in response to, you know, how often should you go, your, go see your teacher? Hell, I was with my teacher almost every day. <laughs> That's how much support I needed. <laughs> And there was times when he would just look at me and he'd say, Craig, you know, we'd be out in the garden, you know, digging some holes or, you know, planting some trees or whatever it was. And he'd say, Craig, sit down. And he'd give me his full attention. He'd fill me with grace. He'd give me the, the pep talk that I needed to take the next step. We were so close that intuitively, even when I wasn't with him and I was having a hard time, all of a sudden the phone would ring and he'd say, Craig, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'd say, oh, I'm being a big idiot. I'm making all kinds of mistakes. I'm falling on my face. He'd say, stop that. Come into the truth. Come into the truth, Craig. 
Do not lose sight of what's real. Do not lose faith. Do not fall into despair. And I can't tell you how many times I fell into despair. I felt like he had a leash around my neck. I would fall into despair <laughs> and he'd pull me back up, <laughs> pull me back up and put me on my feet again. And it was so helpful. And so it's, it's very helpful to have a teacher, to have a counselor, a therapist, a supportive friends, a sangha, a community. You know, a dog, <laughs> sometimes it's just a dog and you look her in the eyes and you know you're going to be okay. You simply see God looking back at you. Simply see God looking back. And so, yes, yes, it's a beautiful thing. You know, when you know right before you're going to fall off that cliff, you need to call your teacher or call your best friend. Call upon God and say, Lord, will you come into me? Will you hold me? Will you fill me with your light, your love, your truth? And the funny thing is, is our heart is always speaking to us. Our heart will tell us which way to go. Which way is up and which way is down will always tell us. And so anyways, if anyone has a question, <clears throat> excuse me, you can uh, type it in the little message board there or uh, raise your hand and ask for the mic. And we'll see what comes. And I saw another, uh, another question that came up uh, uh, this last week from a, a friend of mine. You know, he, he was laughing at me a little bit. He said, Craig, it's, it sounds like you had a pretty traumatic life, pretty uh, dramatic life. He said, doesn't uh, your meditation practice and having a sense of clarity, wouldn't that help you avoid all of that pain and suffering? And I, I laughed a little bit and I said, well, in theory, you know, if your mind is clear and you listen to your heart, then yeah, things tend to go pretty smooth. You know, M Mother Mira, uh, from the Aurobindo ashram. She used to speak about the sunlit path. And the sunlit path is the path of where you step into the space of freedom. You're connected to your heart. You follow your gut. You follow your heart. You live in alignment with truth. That's the sunlit path. Things go pretty smoothly. But, you know, I had a big fat ego <laughs> and I was uh, pretty stubborn and I made very poor choices and I got into really messy, complicated, disastrous relationships. And so I would meditate, I would experience clarity, but I, I didn't always listen to my heart. I didn't listen to my gut. I thought I could meditate all my problems away. I thought if I stepped into peace, then everything would work itself out. But what peace, what's, what is supportive for peace is, it, is if it's followed up with action. With action. And the action must be in alignment with truth. So if you step out of alignment with truth, well, you step out of truth, you step out of awakened mind, you step out of awakened heart. And you step into samsara. You step into samsara. And most of us, I'm, I'm hoping most of us can smile and just admit, yes. Yes, I've been there before. <laughs> and so, yes, yes. Okay, great. And so here comes a question from Neil. Neil writes, Craig, it's good to hear you talk about addictions. I stopped 
um, uh, smoking marijuana maybe a month or two ago now. Now I'm eating sugar. I don't <laughs> feel ready to quit it just yet, but I reckon my body is getting tired of it. I want to be gentle with myself. Any tips? Yeah. Yeah, sugar is another fun one. I can remember I let go of sugar uh, uh, many years ago. And, um, you know, sugar is a comfort food. And, it, it, and it, it's good for us. Like anytime we have an addiction, addictions oftentimes, the, the addictive substance oftentimes does something for our body. Like, for example, uh, marijuana might soothe us. It might take the edge off. Uh, sugar, in a real similar way, it's a, you know, it's a comfort food. It tends to give us a feeling that we're being nurtured. It's very similar to having the edge taking off, taken off. You know, I can say for a long time, I laugh, you know, because I'm gluten-free now, but for a long time, I was ridiculously addicted to pizza. I just loved you know, that big ball of dough in my tummy and it made me feel comfortable. It like brought me back to being a little kid. You know, I've worked with people with all sorts of addictions from, you know, heroin to meth, to, you know, to those uh, uh, opioid drugs and uh, to cigarettes. And, you know, one of the most difficult addictions I ever worked with was a, a good friend of mine. She was addicted to Pepsi. And for the life of her, you know, we got her to quit smoking cigarettes, but she could not give up the Pepsi because the sugar, it provided such comfort to her body. And so the big thing is, Neil, is to wean yourself off of it, but you must replace the feeling of comfort. So if you're taking away the sugar, you have to learn to comfort the body. And so you comfort the body with a light, gentle yoga practice. You know, through laying in bed and literally holding yourself, like literally holding yourself. And so when you see this desire, <clears throat> excuse me, come forward for sugar, you might breathe deeply and hold your belly, hold your heart, comfort your body. Take deep, full belly breaths. Say, I see you. I love you. I'm here for you. To smile with yourself. Sometimes it's nice even just to crawl in bed and get cozy with a blanket and give yourself that feeling of comfort. Give yourself the feeling of comfort. Now, of course, if uh, you know you can't hop in bed and just relax, if you're on your way to work, you know sometimes we have to just use sheer willpower. Sheer willpower, you know, because uh, pardon me, I'm having a technology moment here. Yeah, sometimes we have to use sheer willpower because. We can't comfort ourselves fully. But in any moment, you can take deep, full belly breaths. Deep, full belly breaths. And one of the, one of the ways I help trans... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Wean myself off, you know, off uh, refined sugars was simply transition to fruit sugars. You know, to eat apples or mangoes, grapes and to gently just transition out. Because the body, it's such a creature of habit and addictions, it could be so difficult, so difficult. So if you don't have strong willpower, it's good to slowly wean yourself off of it, start to eat things that are more natural. And then of course, deep, full belly breaths. And I know that sounds very simple, but see, oftentimes the thing with addiction is, is we've literally given our power over to something else. And what you're doing when you're ending the addiction is you're taking your power back. So at, at the core of every addictive tendency is a power issue. We've given our power away and now we're taking it back. But we wanna take it back in a supportive way, a gentle way, a loving way, a kind way. And we must remember, we are doing this because we love ourselves. 
you know, I tell people who smoke cigarettes, we're not, you know, quitting cigarettes because cigarettes are bad. We're choosing to stop smoking because we love ourselves. And there's a little boy or a little girl inside who's drowning in this in the cigarette smoke. And so we we want to bring a greater clarity to her, a greater love to her. And so with something like sugar, you know, there's this tendency to see, oh, there's a little boy within me. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a little boy within me and he doesn't feel fully comfortable in his skin. So the question is, is, can we, can the adult I, can my true self, can the hugeness of my own heart love this kid who feels uncomfortable, who's trying to fill himself, who's trying to fill himself with sugar, or comfort himself with sugar? Can we comfort him with our own love? And as you do so, and you begin to see, oh, I get my power back. Because I'm choosing to take responsibility for my life. I'm choosing to say no to that which is no good for me and an absolute yes for that which is. And if you want to be awake in the world, well, you must be in charge of your own power. If you want to get anything done in this world, you must be rooted in your power. If you want to live in your own angelic nature, and be an angel there in, in Ireland, Mr. Neil, you must be rooted in your power. And this is a beautiful question, so thank you. Okay, so I have one more here. Uh, Craig, I think this one's from Will. Craig, I don't trust myself to hear God and not get uh, not get my will in the way, or not have my will in the way. Yeah, so, uh, so Willow, God is the quietest voice in your head or the quietest voice in your heart, <laughs> whereas your ego will, will be the loudest. And so if you want to trust, I'm going to encourage you to trust the quietest voice within you. So the voice of God, you know, oftentimes we would think that it would be this booming, you know, heavenly voice and there'd be, you know, angels playing trumpets and this and that when God is speaking through you. But the voice of God, oftentimes it just feels like this gentle, very gentle breeze that's flowing through your heart. It'll feel gentle, it'll feel fluid, yet quietly powerful, quietly powerful. And so through trusting yourself, trusting yourself, it means I'm going to take the time to step back and I'm going to notice. I'm calling upon God and then you notice, oh, I hear this really loud voice in my head. <laughs> and it's, you know, like the goody two-shoes voice, you know, the goody goody voice, the the do-gooder voice or whatever that's called, you know, that's really the spiritual superego. So not that voice, not that voice at all. But you're choosing, you're choosing to listen to the quietest voice. It'll be simple, it'll be gentle, it'll be loving. It will not come with a grand argument. Sometimes it'll just simply say yes or no or don't touch that <laughs> or Meditate, do some yoga, lay on the floor, floor, get grounded, step into the truth. Yes, yes. So, um, okay, this one's from Jake. Wow, all you guys are writing questions at the very end. So um, I encourage you that in the future, write them a little bit uh, closer near the middle so I have a chance to get to them. Craig, I'm stuck in self-hatred. My awakening has been so hard. I seem to have internalized everything. What can I do about the self-hatred? Jake, I'm going to invite you to look in the mirror right now and see this gentle, 
innocent presence looking back at you. Gentle, innocent presence. Get to know that, my friend. Get to know that. If you feel the self-hatred, you'll feel like, you know, you, you can, you'll be able to honestly admit there's a child here who's in pain and he doesn't want to hate himself. He wants to love himself. But in order for you to step into love again, I'm going to encourage you to connect with your gentle, innocent presence. All of us have this presence at our core. It's the part of you that notices you've internalized. It's the part of you that notices their self-hatred present. Step into the innocence, my friend, and know you are God. Know you are love. Know you are gentle. Gentle, open-hearted presence. This is the truth, my friend. This is the truth. And so, Uh, last question. I'll see if I can do this in a quick minute here. Michelle writes, my own addictions left the body when I released my trauma. What do you think? Uh, yes, absolutely. So when you embrace trauma and meet trauma with love, oftentimes addictions fall away. Fall away. Some, some addictions are deeply connected with trauma and it's a way of self-soothing the trauma. And so when you meet the trauma with love, and the trauma releases from your body, oftentimes the addiction just goes like that as well. And so that's, that is absolutely a beautiful, um, beautiful realization, Michelle. So thank you for sharing that. I apologize um, uh, if there was any more questions that I missed. Please, uh, you can bring them all next week. I want to thank you all for joining me this evening. I want to uh, let everyone know uh, this, this satsang, this work is supported by donations. So if you want to keep seeing these programs and help me to stay up to date on the technology and uh, be able to pull these off, uh, then please offer a donation. Hit the like button, the subscribe, all that fun stuff. You know, if you're on, you know, listening on YouTube and all that kind of thing. And share the work, but most importantly, live the work. Step into the truth. Be the truth. Be the truth. That's the greatest gift you can give to me or to yourself or to this planet. Live the truth. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening or morning or whatever time of day it is where you are. Peace be with you and have a wonderful night.